I don't know about you, um, you know, most of you know my testimony before I came to the Lord uh, years ago as a young man, I was really involved in uh, a lot of uh, alcoholism and drug addiction and all kinds of crazy things like that. And uh, I got to admit, uh, after uh, days of partying, um, sometimes uh, I didn't wake up feeling as bad as I did on Wednesday morning this past week. Um, uh, and let me just, uh, I just, I just got an email this morning and it came out of Czechoslovakia. Um, and uh, what it said is um, uh, one of the problems facing America is not the election of the president, but, but the mindset of who's electing who and why. Um, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin said that as soon as people realize that their government can pass out entitlements, they will always vote for that party. So I honestly don't know whether we will ever have another decent election in our country um, because of that, because of the entitlements uh, that people receive from government. Um, so having said all of that, you know, the other day it snowed and um, that was strike two for me. I just, uh, I get very depressed in bad weather. I need sunshine. Don't know why I'm here in New England. Uh, Diana laughs about it because they actually went online and looked it up. It's called seasonal adverse disorder. And they, so they joke about, oh, pastor's sad this morning. He's got essay. But, you know, I was just thinking about um, this time of year is rough because uh, we know that we've got a long road uh, ahead of us. I mean, you know, springtime is, is many months away, and, um, and so it can kind of get depressing, and sometimes when we go through trials and tests and attacks, uh, they can get blown out of shape because of the despair that we may be feeling, and, um, and I was thinking also about uh, the poor people in uh, New York and New Jersey. Uh, yesterday for two hours I stood out in front of Ben Franklin's passing out flyers for Rotary. I'm a part of Rotary because I believe in getting involved in community projects and, and being involved in community. So for two hours we're passing out flyers um, for, to raise support for Hurricane Sandy. These, these folks, some of these folks have been without power for over three weeks now. And, uh, and, and this is winter time, you know, it's getting colder and uh, it's such a mess over there. Um, but, you know, in light of all of these things, uh, whether, you know, whether you appreciate what our government's doing or not, or whether you appreciate winter or not, if you do, you're sick. Um, yeah, I just, I, my son, I don't know where he, he must be his, his uh, mother's child because he loves winter. He's a snowboarder. As a matter of fact, he, he moved to Tahoe, California, and he's like, Dad, you got to move out here. And I'm like, son, why would I want to live in a part of the world where it starts snowing in September and it doesn't stop until May? <laughs> you know, there's, but he loves snowboarding and so he's into that. But I wanted to share a message as I was just seeking the heart of the Lord saying, God, uh, you know, in light of, of what, what we experience in life, um, where should we have our mind set? And I just want to share with you uh, in Psalms 46, I want to go through this whole psalm. This is a psalm of David who really understood some hardships. He understood some persecution in his life. He understood what it was like to, uh, to be under the gun. And he starts off in Psalms 46, verse 1, and he says, God is our refuge. And boy, I'll tell you what, that says it all right there. As a matter of fact, that's the title of my message this morning, God is our refuge. God is our refuge. Um, I had written a song um, years ago, and somebody gave it back to me this morning. Um, As the waters revive the deer, we need your spirit in New Hampshire for our state, our cities, our towns. May the rain of your spirit begin to pour down. Uh, we are praying for our state. We ask for your mercy. It's not too late. Forever you're still the same. Our only refuge is in your name. And, uh, and that's so true that God is our refuge. And he goes on and he says he is our refuge and our strength. That when we turn to God, it's not because we're like little scaredy pants and we just want to you know, go and run and, and cower. Uh, no, we turn to God and we run into our refuge. And in his presence, we also find strength. In his presence, we find courage. In his presence, we find boldness. And so God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. 
The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear in two and he burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. So in this psalm, David says twice that God is our stronghold. Once he says God is our refuge. And I think sometimes we just need to remind ourselves who it is that is our source. You know, God's indictment against Israel in the days of Jeremiah was that uh, the Israelites had hewn out, according to God's word, they have hewn out cisterns that could not hold water, and they have forsaken the source of water. And so sometimes when we forsake the source of water, we look to create our own reservoirs. And and Jeremiah's thinking, and in the pictures, that sometimes they would shoot out reservoirs and rock, but there would be a fissure in that rock, and the water would always run out. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, you know, you're you're shooting out cisterns which can't hold water, and you're forsaking the very source of the water in the first place. And so we don't want to do that. We want to recognize that our faith is in the living God. That he is the source of our comfort. He's the source of our strength. He is our refuge. Webster says that a refuge is anything to which one may turn for help, for relief, or for escape. The thesaurus says that a refuge is a hideout. It is a retreat. It is a shelter. It is a safe harbor. It's interesting in verse 2 of that psalm that we just read, he says, because God is my refuge, because God is my strength, because God is an ever-present help in time of trouble, I will not fear. I will not fear the tomorrows because my faith is in God today. And that's a pretty good word, I will not fear, in light of Jesus' statement in Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus starts talking about what are the signs of the end of the world, what are the signs of his second coming, and he says men's hearts will fail them because of fear. And so we don't want to get gripped up in fear. We don't want to be moved by fear because nothing good comes out of fear. He says, rather, I will not be afraid because God is my refuge and God is my source and he's my strength, and so I'm not going to be moved by those things. There's a story in the book of Acts in 27 where Paul is on a ship, and it says in verse 14, before very long there rushed down from the land a violent wind called uh, Uroquilo, and when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and we let ourselves be driven along. You know, there's some times where storms come into our life and we try to fight the storm. And and sometimes that's not always the wisest thing to do. Sometimes there's a time to fight a storm and then there's other times to just let in and drift with the storm and look for the harbor. When you follow the story out in Acts chapter 27, um, they began to jettison everything out of the ship and they, they just let the wind take them over, but they were looking for a shelter. They were looking for a safe harbor where they could beach the boat onto land. And, um, and that was the goal at that point, was to just get to a safe harbor. And sometimes, you know, we just need to go with the storms and understand that we have a harbor, a safe harbor, that we can run to, that we can beach our ship onto, and that is the presence of an immovable, unchangeable, unshakable God. That our faith is in a God who says, I know the beginning from the end. I am the Alpha, the Omega, and there isn't anything that catches me off guard. There isn't anything that knocks me off of my throne. I know the beginning and the end, and I let you know things, and I give you a confidence that I hold the future in my hands. And everything is going exactly as I know is it's going to go, and I'm not alarmed, and you shouldn't be alarmed either. That your faith and your confidence and your assurance should be in this God. That's why it says Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. A city that couldn't be moved, a city that couldn't be shaken. The writer of Hebrews says we have such a city. We have a Zion that is immovable, unshakable, and the presence of our God. And that is good news. Proverbs 18 says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of our God is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it, and they are safe. I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you that you need to understand who your refuge is. 
You need to understand that you can run into the presence of your God because I've got a feeling that we are going to experience hardships. I mean, I'm just talking about natural weather patterns, folks. I'm just talking about earthquakes. I just found out this morning another big earthquake in Kentucky uh, today. Um, so, so, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing an increase of all. And Jesus said, listen, Jesus said, I don't want your hearts to be filled with fear. I want you to know that these things are going to come upon the world as a woman in labor. And as a woman experiences birth pangs, they become more frequent and more intense. And so as we're going into the time where Jesus is going to return, things are going to get more frequent, things are going to get more intense, and our faith needs to be in that our God is our refuge. And there's nothing catching him off guard. Uh, and there's nothing knocking him off his throne. And so because of that, we ought to be immovable also. You know, the larger the problem, the more shelter you need. I mean, you know, if you're just outside and it's raining, you can just say, well, you know what, I can just go in a tent and get out of the rain. But if it's raining and it's windy and it's getting nasty, you might say, well, you know what, a tent isn't going to suffice. I really need to find a house. But if it's really bad and it's a super storm, you say, I don't want a house, I want a castle. I want something that is immovable. And that's what he says, the name of our God is a castle. It's a strong tower. And the righteous run to the name. And when he's talking about the name of God, he's talking about the presence or the character or the person that that name represents. He's talking about running into the harbor of God's heart. He's talking about running into the harbor of God's person whom he is, that he will shelter, he will be a shelter to us in the middle of the storm. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 7. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the flood came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it did not fall, for it had been founded on a rock. Everyone who hears the words of mine and does not act on them is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand, and the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so he's talking here about two houses, uh, same uh, different foundations, the same winds came, the same rains came, the same floods come, and the only difference between what house stands and what house falls is they both hear the word, it's just that one acts on it. And so they're hearing the word, it's just a matter of whether they're acting on the word. And so he's saying, I want you to be believers in the word that are acting on the word, that are actually putting traction to the word, that are, that are, are, are living your lives by the instruction of the word, that it becomes the foundation of what you're building on. So you don't build your life on other things. Uh, regardless of what they are. You don't build your marriage on those. You don't build your vocation on those. You don't build your family on those. You don't build your future on those things. You build solidly on the immovable rock of the Word of God. Do what the Word of God says and trust in the God of the Word that He will back over. He says, I watch over my Word to perform it. It will not return unto me void without accomplishing that which I sent it to do. And so when we build our lives on the Word and God's watching over the Word, then He's now watching over your life built on the Word. And that's why Paul said, I'm convinced that he is able to guard everything that I entrust unto him, including our lives. You know, to trust him means to know who he is, to understand his character, to feel safe in his presence, to know that he will not reject us, to know that he is always welcoming us because of faith in his son, Jesus Christ. You see, the darkest hour can hit your life. And it doesn't have to cast a shadow on God's character. People who don't know God's character a lot of times turn and begin to blame God when things start happening. But that's not what has to happen. We don't have to start questioning God and blaming God when we understand his character and who he is. When we look at uh, the life of Job and all the calamities that came against Job, Job's wife wanted to blame God and she wanted to encourage him to blame God, but Job wasn't going to blame God. 
He says, no, I know my Redeemer lives and I will see him on the earth. I'm not going to blame God. I'm not going to put this off to blaming God. Uh, the three Hebrew children in the middle of the fire, when they were thrown in the fire of Babylon in that furnace, they didn't blame God. They didn't say, oh God, why are we here? Why did you do this to us? As a matter of fact, they did just the opposite. They said, I want you to know something, king. You can throw us in that fire. Our faith is, is that God can deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down and worship you. And so their faith was in God, not against God. And they didn't have to judge God or cast dispersions against God. Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, thrown into the middle of a Philippian jail, thrown into the inner dungeons, their hands and their feet in stocks. They didn't sit there and say, God, why are you doing this? Why are you letting this happen? They began to worship God. They began to praise God because they understood the immutability of the character of God, that God is unchanging. He says, I am the Lord, I changeth not. The Bible says there's no shifting shadows uh, or variance with God. He doesn't change. And so the same God that blesses you one day is not the God that's all of a sudden cursing you and causing everything bad to go in your life the next day. And so we don't have to be moved by the dark times or the storms or the trials or the tests. Hey, we live in a fallen world. And Jesus said, I want you to get it. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. And so we understand that we don't have to have the dark times cast a dispersion on the character of who God is. He's always the same. He doesn't change. And you know what the Bible says? You know, my Bible says God is good. God is good. His plans for us are good and not for evil. You see, the real problem is, the real problem is, is that when the problems hit, that we get our eyes on the problem. That's the real problem. Getting our eyes on the problem is the real problem. Taking our eyes off of God is the real problem. You see, Peter's problem wasn't the wind and the waves. Peter's problem was getting his eyes on the wind and the waves, and then he began to sink. Israel's problem wasn't Goliath. Israel's problems was getting their eyes on Goliath and making him a bigger giant than God is. And our God is a giant. And he is a giant killer. And so the problem is, is getting our eyes on the problem, and then when we do that, we take our eyes off of the goodness of God, the character of God, the love of God, the immutability of God, the faithfulness of God, the honor of God, everything that constitutes who he is in his personhood. And when we do that, then we're not going to run into the safe harbor that our God is. Because if I'm questioning God, I'm not running to him and so that's the real problem in times of trouble i don't want to be questioning him i want to be running to him i want to be in that shelter of that safe harbor of who he is and who his presence is i don't want to be moved from anything you know there's a there's another refuge out there and it's what i call the refuge of lies the refuge of lies is is that i don't have to worry because my savings account will get me through i don't have to worry about it because i'm in good health right now and that'll always carry me through i don't have to worry because i've got training and experience i don't have to worry about anything because i believe in our national defense yeah, I, well, you know, we know that the Bible says unless the Lord watches over the city, they who watch over it watch in vain, right? Why? Because our refuge is not in those who watch over the city. Our refuge is watch, he who is watching over those who are watching over the city. He who is watching over all things, and that is God. And so we got to get rid of the refuge of lies that nothing bad will ever come close to me. I'm in an insulated little bubble of security. Oh, oh my goodness, that is a refuge of lies. And we don't want to run into the refuge of lies. We want to run into the refuge of who God is and in his immutable character and, and who he reveals himself to be in the word of God. And he is close to those who are troubled. He is close to those who are wounded and those who are of a contrite spirit and those who are broken. I remember years ago, uh, my pastor always used to say, when you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. 
And I remember an illustration that Kenneth Hagin gave years ago, uh, and this was a true story where uh, around the time of World War II, there were these soldiers that were trying to work with this hot air balloon. And it, be, and it came untethered, and it started to rise, and a bunch of shol- soldiers grabbed hold of the ropes trying to hold it down, but it was too massive, and it began to lift them all, all off the ground. And some of them just kind of let go the minute it started to get off the ground, which caused it to go off the ground all that much faster and higher. And there was a few of them that just hung on and hung on as it went up high, high, high. It went up to a certain altitude and then stopped because it began to cool, but it just hung there. And as the soldiers on the ground were watching the ones that were dangling up in the air, they were mortified how after, you know, five minutes, ten minutes, their strength began to let go and they began to fall to their death. Except for this one guy that just hung on forever, it seemed like. And then after hours had passed, the thing began to cool and it began to descend. And they ran over to where that guy was and they said, how were you able to hold on for so long? We're talking hours now. And he said, oh, you don't understand. As soon as that sucker lifted me off the ground, he says, I grabbed that rope behind me, tied it around my waist, and I let it hold me. So you can try with all your might to try to hold on to God, or you can just lay back in faith and let him hold on to you. He'll hold you up a lot longer than you'll hold yourself up. He'll hold you up a lot longer than you can hold on to him for all your worth. So I run to the refuge of who God is, and I let him hold me. I let him sustain me. There's a story once of a guy who lived in a swamp, and, uh, uh, and people said, man, this thing is filled with poisonous snakes. It's filled with alligators, and you know, aren't, aren't you afraid? And his response was, no, I'm not afraid, because faith closes my door every night, and mercy opens it every morning. And my faith in God closes my door every night and his mercy causes me to see the light of day again on another day and that's the way it is for those who make god their refuge that's how it is for those that run into the safe harbor of who god is faith closes the door every night god i'm laying my head on the pillow and i'm going to sleep like a baby and i'm not going to worry about anything because i know who controls everything i know whose hand is controlling the nations and i know whose will is perfectly being fulfilled ultimately and uh, and my faith is in you and in your mercy you'll wake me up again and i will awaken with your likeness the bible says we will awaken with his likeness on our face as we go to sleep in faith and confidence we shouldn't toss and turn and be racked with concerns about what about this what about my finances what about my health what about this what about that hey i know where i'm going ultimately right i don't care how i get there doesn't matter i mean it really it it, it doesn't really matter does it really matter i mean car accident illness dying from an abundance of good looks i mean you know who knows right i mean you know in invasion i mean it doesn't really matter i mean we're all going in that route we're all going to experience this thing called death and so my faith isn't up to that experience my faith transcends that experience jesus said everyone who believes in me yet though they die will they live forever So I don't hang a lot on the things of this life and this world. And I can sleep really, really good. And uh, and I and I trust you do too. If God is your refuge, there was a story. This is actually a true account. In World War II, there was a soldier that was in the heat of combat, and he got shot directly in the chest. But he had a Bible in his pocket and that bullet hit that bible and went into that bible and the nose of that bullet pierced through uh the 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 first few books of that bible about halfway through and it stopped right on psalms 91 and as he read down he looked at 91 7 a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right but it'll not come near you And that's the confidence that we have when we make God our refuge, that we can run into the presence of God. You know, in Numbers 35, in God's order of government, as he was establishing his nation and his people, he said that, I want you to select cities that are going to be called cities of refuge. 
so that in all of the coasts of Israel, should somebody accidentally kill somebody, and their next of kin wants to lift that guy's head off of his shoulders, then that guy can run to a city of refuge and be safe there from the avenger of blood. And he says, let me give you an illustration. You're out cutting trees. And, uh, you know, and I'm out there cutting some apple trees down with Ray Hetner. And uh, my, my axe flies off of the head of the handle and hits Ray in the head and sends him home to Jesus. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> Ray's next of kin, namely Sandy, is probably going to come looking for me to lift my head off of my shoulders. Right? Well, in ancient Israel... It wasn't murder, it wasn't intentional, it wasn't premeditated. So I run to a city of refuge, and I get myself in there, and I am safe as long as I'm in that city. But the last part of the explanation was, is see to it that the person does not leave the city of refuge. Because if he leaves the city of refuge just to go over here to a yard sale, and that next of kin sees me there, they can exact vengeance and take my life because I left the city of refuge. And God is saying, I have made for you a city of refuge in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And run to him and cleave to him and see to it that you don't leave that city. See to it that you don't stray away from him, because that's when troubles can really start to hit your life. Make sure that you stay where it's safe. Years ago, <laughs> I remember watching this document, document, uh, documentation, and, and it was uh, years ago, there was, a, there was a, a tsunami that was heading towards the coast of Florida. And um, they, they had had uh, an alert that this big wave was coming in, and so a lot of people evacuated and headed further inland. But there was a photographer that actually, before leaving, took pictures, and there was one area where there were about 15 people around their cars on the beach because they wanted to see the wave come in. They, they, they were like, oh, goody, a big wave's coming in. They were, never seen, they were never seen from again. Their cars were never seen from again. It was like they vanished off the face of the earth. Why? Because they were somewhere that they did not belong. They were somewhere that they should not have been. And God tells us, there are places you don't belong. If you're going to be in the city of refuge, stay in the city of refuge, and don't go to places where you don't belong. Don't go to places where you shouldn't be. Because he has provided a city of refuge that we can run in. Look at this psalm, Psalms 91. Such a great psalm, verses 1 through 4. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells in the shelter, he who dwells, he who dwells, not just when things get tough, like, oh God, help me, but you're dwelling there. You're living there because God is good. And he will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I don't know about you, but in the book of Acts, it says that Peter's shadow healed the sick. So can you imagine what it's like to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty in that place of refuge? I will say of the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. Here's something where he's using the words of his mouth. He is making a declaration. I am speaking these words out. As I believe, so I speak. And I say these words, my refuge, my fortress. You see, when we started this thing off in Psalms uh, 61, or 46 rather, it says God is a refuge. And I think we've established that. But now it boils down to he's my refuge. He's my fortress. This is now a personal declaration of faith. This is not that God is a shepherd. David said, God is my shepherd. This is not that God is a refuge. Now it's God is my refuge. It's a choice that I'm making, that I'm going to dwell in the presence of God. I'm going to be in the shadow of my God. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God in whom I trust. 
For it is he who delivers you from the snare and the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. That's who God is. He is the glory. He is the lifter of our heads. He is the fire in our midst. And he says, I will say of the Lord. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 11.3 that the worlds are framed by the word of God. And your world is framed by the word of God and by the words that you speak of the word of God. So when you make that declaration and you understand and you've confirmed this in your heart that it is an immovable truth that God is my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my strength. I'm not going to be moved. What did David say? Though the seas roar and foam and though the mountains melt and slip into the sea and though the nations uproar uh, and at times of calamity, I'm not going to be moved because I have made the Lord my refuge. And I know that all of this is just transitional. I am just a sojourner passing through. I'm just a pilgrim. I'm a journeyer. And my journey is not here and now. My journey is coming then. When I will see him face to face and I will be like him. The Cardinal of Rome spoke to Luther after he had posted his 95-point thesis on the Wittenberg Cathedral, and after he had started a Reformation, the Roman Catholic Cardinal got to Luther and he said this. He said, what do you think the Pope cares for the opinion of a German boar? The Pope's little finger is stronger than all of Germany. Do you expect your princes to take up arms to defend you, a wretched worm like you? I tell you no. And where will you be then? Luther's famous response was, I will be then where I am now, in the hands of Almighty God. Isn't that, I mean, that just sums it up. That wasn't something that he thought through at the last minute. That was something he was basing his life in. I will be then where I am now, in the hands of God. I've placed myself in the hands of God. And I'm inscribed there, and no one can take me out. You see, where you will be when trouble hits depends a real lot on where you are right now. A real lot on where you are right now. This world is like an airplane whose engines have fallen off. You know, there's a movie out there right now with Denzel Washington called Flight. You know, about this airplane that gets into a disaster. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Don't plan on it. But, you know, and somehow he saves that airplane. Well, I'll tell you what. This world is like an airplane whose engines have fallen off. It's irrevocable. It's unchangeable. It's it's like the Titanic that that hit the iceberg. It's, It's going down. It's going to be changed. And the Scriptures are very clear about this. The Word of God teaches us that there's a time coming when Jesus will judge this world, and things will change. And our only hope is in the refuge of who our God is. In Psalms 91, verse 14, he says, Because he has loved me, this is God speaking now in this psalm, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. You see, where you are when trouble hits depends a lot on where you are right now. And God is saying, because he has loved me, I will deliver. I will deliver those who I love. And I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. Remember, he said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And here he says, I will set him securely on high because he's known my name. He's known my name is a reflection of my character and my personality and who I am. And because he's taking safe harbor in the personhood of who God is, the character, the attributes, the reality of this God of love who sent Jesus Christ to redeem us from our fall and from our sin. And there's a time coming when he will judge this world and we look for new heavens and new earth. 
We look for a new city whose builder and maker is God. We look for a city that will be unmovable and unshakable at that time. We read towards the end of the book of Revelation in chapters 19, 20, 21, that there's a time coming when uh, he says, uh, the old will be set aside, and behold, I'm making all things new. And there will be no more death, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more pain, there will be no more crying. And we look for that time, that utopia, that paradise, that time that we call heaven, eternal life. Not just the quality, uh, or, or, but quantity also, just this beautiful existence. And that's where, that's where our faith is. That's where our faith is. Somebody once preached a message years ago, a very famous preacher, I can't remember his name right now, but he pre- preached a message someday heaven someday payday but but not maybe right now but we can relax and have faith in god who is our refuge i want you to just bow your heads for a moment just close your eyes for a moment this morning i wonder if you know this god I wonder if God is really your refuge or if you think of other things, if you think of your future, if you think of the security of finances or whatever it might be. Or do you know God? Is he your refuge? When the Titanic was ripped open by an iceberg, The engineers and the captains, they knew that it was a matter of hours before that thing would go down. God knows that this world will end. He knows that it's under a sentence of condemnation and a sentence of judgment. And he has sent Jesus Christ into the world to redeem us and bring us into the harbor, into the shelter, into the strong tower of his name. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, you know, honestly, if I were to die this week, I don't know where I would spend eternity. Well, I've got good news for you. Jesus died. He shed his blood on the cross, his innocence for your guilt, so that you could know, that you could have assurance that you have eternal life by having faith and confidence in him jesus said i am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father except through me there is no other way into the harbor of god's refuge except through the person of jesus christ because only jesus deals with that which plagues the heart of humanity and that's the issue of sin my sin and your sin And maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I've never asked Jesus Christ to come into my life to forgive me and cleanse me of sin and to give me the hope and the promise of life everlasting to where I know that God is my refuge, that God is my strong tower and my deliverer so that I can set my love upon this God who loved me first. If that's you this morning and God's been speaking to your heart and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. And I want to invite him into my heart. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now where I can see it? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Is there one this morning you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to the person of Jesus Christ. I want to give my heart to Jesus. Yes, thank you very much. Is there someone else? You'd say, Pastor, I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to know that when my eyes dim, I will awaken in the presence of my God. Forever safe and secure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For you who raised your hand, someone's going to come right up to you at the end of this service give you some material and pray for you and encourage you, the most important decision you will ever make in your life is to give your life to Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, I want to encourage you. Don't let your faith be a second-hand thing. 
Don't let your walk be only a Sunday morning go to church thing. Make God your refuge. Make God your deliverer, your strong and mighty tower. Be immovable and unshakable because you are hand in hand with an immovable, unshakable God. Have a vibrant faith. Fuel your faith through prayer and through reading the scriptures and by faithfully attending a church. Fuel the things that are eternal. Fuel the things that are important to life. And have a confidence that though the mountains fall into the sea, and though the seas roar, and though all the nations rise in an uproar, I really don't care. I am not moved by any of this because I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have set my affection upon, and he will deliver me, and he will set me securely on high. Father, we thank you. We thank you this morning that as believers, we have belief, not in a system, not in a set of doctrines, but in a living God that is personal, that communes with us, that fellowships with us, that loves us, that leads us and directs us and guides our steps, that we have a belief in a person of Jesus Christ, who yet though he was dead, he is alive now forevermore. And he is more intimate and more real and more personal than any other person we could ever know. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as we see ourselves approaching the soon return, help us to stay passionate in reality, in communion with our God. And because of that, our hearts will be immovable. For you are our refuge. And we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Hey, greet somebody again. Tell them you are glad to see them here today and that God is your refuge.